Between you and Brian Keating, who has the better basketball game? Brian's a bit of a juggernaut, so he has a way of um, hacking his way to to the rim. You know, I think the last game we played, he did beat me, but mm. I think I think he owes me a game now, and I think this time around, I will slam dunk on him. Oh my gosh! I, I just gotta fix. I, I just gotta fix my knees. That's all. I just gotta fix my knees. <laughs> Stefan Alexander is a theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and jazz musician whose work transcends the boundaries between science and the arts. He is a professor at my alma mater, Brown University. Today, we discuss Carl Jung, the connection between music and physics, and his two books. Chapters with timestamps are broken out below. Please like and subscribe, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Professor Alexander, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yes, it's, it's such a pleasure. Yes, and I cannot wait uh, to dive into your uh, two excellent books, which I have right here. Um, so much to cover. And uh, we're going to dive right in. I want to start off with uh, The Jazz of Physics, which I read a couple of years ago and uh, absolutely loved. So for folks who aren't uh, familiar with your work, uh, you discuss the parallels between the structure of the universe and the structure of music. Um, what do you think is the strongest link between those two things, the universe and music? Sorry about that. Um, that's that's definitely not the link. Uh, um, um, I, that's a really good one. Um, I think that um, it's probably the most obvious thing, which is that you know so much of the language of physics is coded in sort of waves and vibrations. I mean, we not, we understand that um, as it stands right now, the, our best description of sort of all the forces and matter and, you know, their interactions um, mm -hmm. is described in terms of quantum fields. And the minute, you know, the, like a magnetic field, for example, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, it, you know it, can, it can bend, it can warp, right? And grab mm -hmm. the gravitational field, um, the strong force, right? So all of these, um, so nature is described by fields and fields are, um, you know, they um, undergo vibrational patterns, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the, those vibrational patterns dictate, um, you know, much of the physics that we understand. So the universe is permeated by these by these fields, and these fields are quantized, quantum fields, right? So uh, we can get in, more into the, into that later on. And you know, sure. music is also coded, right? In terms of, uh, it's some people say music is just organized sound waves, right? So that's definitely a, a very strong link, and. One can use that. You can, one can use um, that to sort of cast uh, you know, to make make analogies between the happenings of physics at a more fundamental level, and also you know um, a little bit about how music works, how music functions um, in terms of organized music being organized sound and sound basically sound waves, um, and mm -hmm. we can use that to con you know to connect two things. Yeah, it's a wonderful start. The one thing you uh, talk about in the book, and uh, there's a few things I think we'll kind of go through a bit of the history of this, is uh, Pythagoras and his love for music and the harmony of the spheres. Um, how do you interpret this ancient idea and how does it relate to our current understanding of physics? Yeah, the Pythagoreans are, um, you know, sort of at the birth of ancient Greek um, sort of physics and philosophy, natural sciences, is a big part of our scientific tradition, which is that we are able to theorize and use mathematics as um, a language, right, to describe um, and predict and, and, and know things about the physical world now that we can directly perceive with our five senses. I mean, mm. we, we have to use, of course, high energy experiments, um, you know, such as um, what our friend Brian Keaton does, right? Um, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Using a telescope to look at the early universe, look at the Big Bang directly, sure. um, as well as the Large Hadron Collider, right? So we can, so that tradition, that tradition, um, you know, the, the Pythagoreans and then, of course, Plato and Aristotle and that whole tradition was about basically using mathematical reasoning um, to, to understand physical law. That, as well as, you know, um, 
as well as, as you know, what Pythagoras uh, was. Um, what the legend has is that he created um, by experimenting with the vibration of strings, he created, mm -hmm. of, of course, our musical system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the level of music theory, right, how we get into um, musical music theory, um, again, some of the analysis, some of the, the language we can use also is um, can be based on geometry and number mm. theory and all these other interesting things. It's a, another right. way in. And that's definitely, mm. I would say, part of that, that whole tradition as well. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it's, it's I think not it's so fascinating. Way, it's, not, it's not the only yeah. way in, of course. I mean, you, you know, obviously, and music is a lot more than just mm -hmm. like, you know, trying to theorize about it, right? Music is something mm. that's, that we experience and that we play. But it's mm. part of that tradition, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And the... I mentioned in the introduction uh, of this podcast, but you know you're you're a jazz musician on, on top of being a physics professor, and that's of course what I, one of the things I loved about your book is you find these connections, these patterns between domains that would otherwise seem completely separate from one another, uh, and I find the beauty in that as well. It's one thing I, I try to do um, with some of my research and some of my you know, layman research, you know, armchair kind of uh, investigations and the explainer videos I make is to try to find these strange random connections between places that don't seem like they should have them. Um, and another one, before we get to, we'll definitely talk about John Coltrane's um, mathematics and music diagram, which you talked about at length in the book. But one other thing is uh, Kepler. Now he used music to explain, I believe it was the elliptical orbits. Um, can yes. you tell us a little bit about that and just the mapping that he made there between music and um, the orbits of our solar system? Yeah, yeah, so for many years, I mean, Kepler laboriously tried to understand using, of course, um, telescopic data of the, the motion of planets. Um, he wanted to, that program dating back to the Pythagoreans, you know, almost yeah. like you know, 2000 years prior to Kepler. People were still, all these great philosophers um, were trying to understand still the motion of the planets. Like, you know, why were they undergoing the motion that, that we saw them? And they wanted, they were seeking out some physical explanation for that. And of course, the big deal was that Kepler figured out the laws. He actually figured out a universal law, one law that would explain all the planets. And that's kind of one of the beauties of our physics, yeah. which is the efficiency of like, one law, right? Like Newton's law, for example, to explain everywhere, every, everything from the, you know, if I drop this mug, which I won't, um, to, the, to the motion of the moon around the earth and then from the motion of the earth around the sun and other planets. So Kepler was the one that really figured out that was the first to really just do that. And how he did that, how he got into that and cracked that code was um, he... Um, understood he was working within that Pythagorean tradition, the idea of music of the spheres, the idea that, that you know, the Pythagoreans had, that the planets were you know, moving around in some kind of harmonic motion mm -hmm. associated with, um, with musical tones, right? And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and their orbits were somehow related to these whole integer ratios, just like music. And mm -hmm. one of the important um, ratios in music is um, the perfect fifth. Um, you know, maybe I can demonstrate some of that. Oh, I have my, I have wonderful. You're getting a free we'll show, see. folks. Um, so, yeah. awesome. you know, um, the perfect fifth is basically the statement that my saxophone uh, will contain a sound wave, basically. So the, what we call a fundamental will be the longest wave that can fit in terms of an air, um, the, um, you know, the, the, um, a wave pattern um, um, from, from vibrating um, air molecules, right? So if mm. I play, for example, um, the low C, yeah. right? Mm. So if I actually clip the wave, if I, if I can do that by basically, you know, I'm stopping mm. the wave by only pressing down here in one half of the original wavelength, right? So that mm -hmm. would be, right? But if I do two thirds, right? Two thirds of the original wave, right? It's, right? 
Mm-hmm. Right. So that's a perfect mm-hmm. fifth. That's a very important um, relationship in, in, in music that is used in basically much of Western composition and jazz music and American, like just popular music, that perfect fifth. And it's related to this two thirds. Kepler was going after that. He was trying to find this two thirds mm. in, the, in the motion of the plant. So he actually wrote down musical notes associated with the, with the um, speed of the planets by looking at ratios mm. of the planets, the, of, their, of their velocities uh, at different, you know, it's a long story um, and it's described in a book, but um, mm. in a nutshell, he couldn't find it. He was instead mm. finding, you know, other things that was not akin to what he was looking for. Then he found it by considering polyphony, by considering all of the planet's motions, and all of it, he was able to find that two thirds, and that two thirds became Kepler's law. The two third is the fact that the period of the planet, you know, how long it takes um, the planet to go around the sun in an elliptical orbit, and the distance between the planet to the sun, you know, mm-hmm. at, at, at when it's closest to the sun. Kepler's law relates. Those two quantities, if you know the distance mm-hmm. uh, and you, um, you cube that, it's equal to the period squared. So that's where the two-thirds, the two-thirds were the, w- w- uh, was in the equation that he discovered. Um, oh. So that's like that. I mean, and that was the first, we call Kepler the first astrophysicist because he was the first person mm-hmm. in human history that we know of to write down an equation for the motion of planets. Um, and, and it worked for all the plants. We still use that equation. And then of course that inspired Isaac Newton mm. to try to, un- to try to explain where that is coming from. And that's of course Newton's laws. So it's, a, um, and calculus and so on and so forth. Yeah. So you can see how important it was that Kepler relied also on musical analysis, right? In, in his, mm. his scientific discovery process. And that was very inspirational to me. I wish I had known mm. that when I was a student, right? Mm. Let me put this down. Sure. Yeah. I'll give you a second. Thank you so much for the uh, demonstration. Now, I, I forget what, if it's a cube is, is T square or T square is a T cube is a, a cube, but we can mm. double check that. We can double check that later. I'll find it, put it in the description for folks who want to go down that rabbit hole. Thank mm. you so much. That was wonderful. And it's great to get the, uh, that context, that history lesson. And well, one thing I definitely wanted to talk to you a little bit about was the, uh, as you talked about in the book is, John Coltrane's mathematics and music diagram, which is something that I'm still wrapping my head around ever, ever since I saw it in the book, I read it a few years ago, something I return to every once in a while. And maybe <clears> once, <throat> twice a year, I think about it, I look at it and I am, uh, I know next, next to nothing about music theory, honestly, I know tiny little things here and there, but, um, can you tell us, and I might even, um, overlay onto this video of ours a diagram of Coltrane's um, of a circular diagram with the, uh, with the mm-hmm. chords on it and everything. Can you give us, um, let's say for people who you know, don't know a whole, whole lot about music theory, what's the significance of this, of this diagram? Um, well, the significance of it for me at least was the, just the importance that a musician like Coltrane wasn't didn't you know didn't fit in a box he wasn't mm. like oh i'm just this jazz musician that's going out performing for people and and he was also a researcher he was also mm. trying to theorize and construct new systems um and new ways of approaching his practice as well so the coltrane diagram to me at least you know is an example where he is taking ideas from albert einstein which is the idea of symmetry and invariance at the speed of light, no matter what frame of reference one is in, you know, mm. what your state of motion is, everyone will agree um, that the speed of light is still the same, right? And this is a big deal, right? Um, but at the root of that is the idea of invariance and symmetry. Yeah. Um, and if you look at Coltrane's diagram, you notice that it is loaded with, with, with those two concepts, it's loaded with symmetry, in terms of That's like, true. he draws these, um, you know, he has a circle, a 60 sided circle, and then there are all these symmetric relationships between the different notes in that circle. 
Mm. Um, I believe that, you know, I make the case that Train was trying to, um, was working on his own new system. And you can mm. hear that system. You can hear that um, in Giant Steps. Giant Steps is a harmonic motion mm. through a symmetric placement of <clears throat> what we call tonal centers. Meaning that mm. if I'm in a key of C, you know, or I'm in a key of G, those are, those are the home keys, right? Of um, um, the home keys of um, of a scale, and mm. Coltrane. A lot of jazz song is basically songs have a structure that one improvise through, and Coltrane was working on new systems that were related to to fundamental physics. And I think that he was tr make, trying to make a link between just the happenings of the universe and the cosmos, and whether or not th that some of that can be mirrored or coded right in in music because he wanted to basically warp and bend you know the fact you know he 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 coltrane really believed that he can change the world and change mm. people and he did through his mm. music and one way into that was using the you know similar anal um, means of analysis that his heroes like albert einstein did so he studied albert einstein as well okay. as other people and that sure. was his way into it yeah Gotcha. That's fascinating. The um, so correct, that a lot of we, jazz musicians were like physicists in in, in that sense, mm, right? Yeah, experimenters, sure. Yeah, and brilliant, brilliant mind. Um, mm -hmm. So correct me if I'm wrong. It's based on the pentatonic scale, right? The, the his his diagram. How universal is this scale? And I think about this um, kind of broadly. Just how amazing it is that across many cultures, we just find say most f find the same kinds of patterns and rhythms appealing and, and, and appeasing. Um, can you give us a sense of just how universal um, this, the Coltrane circle applies? Yeah. I mean, so that's true. I mean, so some of the, not all, but some of the Coltrane system is based on the pentatonic scales okay. and he uses a lot. I mean, in his improvisation, you can hear, a very advanced sort of um, dem, uh, you know display of his mastery of of pen of of, pentatis, of the pentatonic um, system. Um, <clears throat> what is a pentatonic scale, and why is it universal? I mean, um, making the case. Um, this is another interesting link between physics and music, because mm -hmm. if you that perfect fifth that I just showed you, um, it happens because of the natural sympathetic vibrations that where if I, if I, if I look at the physical vibration of a musical instrument, right. Um, it naturally, the physics of, of the physics of how that vibrational pattern is, is sourced or generated. Um, though, if you, if you actually look at the wave patterns, it contains in it. So if I play C, um, there's something called a harmonic series, meaning that there are other vibrations that are natural that are contained in that yeah. note. And that, it turns out that prominent in that is the G. The G is, you know, yeah. uh, one of the um, dominant, okay, um, overtone series, meaning that it's a, it's a so the two thirds, if I, if I have a C and it's, you know, one wavelength, that two thirds, that wavelength um, is also going to be contained. So that's a physical thing. That's a physical phenomenon. You know? right. So a wave, um, a musical wave is a physical thing. Mm -hmm. the, so the perfect fifth is contained in that. So mm -hmm. as, you know, humans, we are kind of antennas. We pick up, right? We receive and process these sound waves. Right. So our ears and our brains, they, you know, they also have to vibrate along, right? Um, mm -hmm. A fancy word they have to transduce that physical sound wave and so it's interesting that um that perfect fifth if you actually organize notes in terms of perfect fifths that is the pentatonic scale that uh, okay. is what we call the major and the minor pentatonic scale hmm. so i mean again it's best described by a demonstration um, so Again, if I play only perfect fifths, which I, which I just said are like these natural vibrations contained. So if I play like C, right? Let me see if I can pull this off. 
Sure. I can't be here. So, uh, the, 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 what I'm going to do is play a sequence of perfect fifths. <laughs> So I just played perfect fifths, and what I can now do is reorganize those same notes from lowest the lowest pitch to the highest pitch. I just played you like five perfect fifths, so okay. now I'm just gonna like reorganize them, play the same notes, right? <laughs> So mm-hmm. that's 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 a pentatonic, and it's oh, just okay. it's just physically generated. Hmm. Right? So yeah. there's something universal in the sense that it's physics, right? <laughs> yeah. So you know, one can make the case that um, maybe the reason why the pentatonic scale is universal amongst human cultures is maybe because of that. That's an interesting hypothesis. It may yeah. not be the only hypothesis, but sure, it's a simple one. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And I did want to ask you um, one, one last question specifically about the Coltrane diagram is that it's, it's presented as flat and it has the, the, all the connections on it, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, does it have a dimensionality to it? Is it, is it, I know it's presented flat, but is it two dimensional? Mm-hmm. Is it multidimensional? Should we think of it as having uh even even more say connections than just we look at it on a flat surface does that make sense is it more dimensional than than it appears um say that again oh sure the the coltrane diagram it's you know you look at it it's on a it's a flat circle with all the connections between it between the the say different chords and the, and different notes is it is it is it technically flat or is there are there more dimensions to it? Like, can, should we think of it as being, um, say, three dimensional, or even even more dimensions, having more dimensions? Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I it, so I mean, Coltrane's uh, representation of it is in a two dimensional surface. But mm-hmm. um, speaking to other people that knew him in my, you know, when I was researching the book, he was trying to think in terms of higher dimensions. So, um, and that led me down a rabbit hole with my friend and colleague, Robert Rowe, who's at NYU. He's, um, in the, you know, one of the pioneers in music machine learning and music theory. And we started to actually see if we can come up with a, a sort of like a post Coltrane diagram that was in that spirit. And we, we did come up with a four dimensional version or some variant of what Coltrane did. We call it the pentahelix, right? So uh, maybe I can share that with you um, later on. I love to see that. Yeah, I've done a lot of research on you um, for this interview, but I haven't come across that yet. I don't know if that's, is that behind closed doors still? Are you waiting to uh, to share that? Yeah, we're in the the middle of a a research. Yeah, we're in the middle of a research project with that where we are. It's basically, again, uh, based on this idea that music can be represented as some sort of geometric space. The same way space and time is represented mm-hmm. by geometry, according to Einstein, um, we wanted to construct um, a, ge- a, a, a musical geometry. This is a whole tradition in music theory. Um, people like Fred Lodal and, you know, Carol uh, Kremanskill, and these are important people in the music theory space where mm-hmm. they try to construct musical geometry. Geometry, um, usually called tonal pitch space, so some internal representation of how we perceive um, musical tones and uh, the organization of musical tones um, in terms of a a geometric space. And so, again, Coltrane was working in that tradition. Um, He was way ahead of his time Mm. (laughs) um, because that's a a research field now in um, in music theory and music cognition. And Mm. so we, um, Robert Rowe and I, developed a model um, that, you know, that. um, um, of that geometry, and we call it the pentahelix. 
Oh, awesome. Well, I can't wait to see more about that. Yeah, definitely will be interested. Based on a piece of mathematics called simplicial complexes. That's, Hmm. again, very useful in graph theory and, um, you know, graph neural networks and um, and um, even theories of quantum gravity uses this type of mathematics. So it's Hmm. it finds a nice home in music Hmm. theory as well. Yeah. Oh, wow. So cool. I can't wait to see more about that and learn more about that. Um, one of the things from the book, I'm actually not sure which book. But it don't book... mean a thing. Oh. It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Oh, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's got to sound good. Um, well, one of the things, I'm actually, actually not sure if this was from the Jazz of Physics or um, your, your second book or from an interview, but you did mention, and I was wondering if we can extend these analogies a little bit, maybe as an interview that the inflaton field could be thought of as a cosmic conductor, something like that. Mm. And mm-hmm. uh, I actually did a video, an explainer video a few months back on quantum foam, this you know highly theoretical mm-hmm. idea, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And um, I, when, I, when I was making the video, I was trying to understand that I kept thinking of quantum foam as like the dance floor of reality, as it being this like, you know, we, we obviously don't know it exists necessarily. It's still like so theoretical and so small potentially. Um, well, it would be so small, but, uh, as this thing that was uncertain at, at certain tiny, tiny scales, the Planck scale, let's say, have you ever thought of there being some kind of say, say mapping between certain concepts in music and what we have in fundamental physics? So things like rhythm, harmony, melody, like, do you think that there, have you ever tried to map things out to things like resonance, symmetry, vibrations, like actually like one to one? as close as we can get, like one-to-one. Are there, are there other analogies? Are there um, mappings that, that you've uh, realized over time? Um, you might need to say that one more time. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's yeah. more, it's a little bit more, it's kind of a pie-in-the-sky thing, this idea mm-hmm. that if, say, I think you did mention the inflaton field as cosmic conductor, I remember that sticking mm-hmm. out to me specifically. Mm-hmm. And I was mm-hmm. wondering, like, what other elements of music can we kind of map to uh, core concepts in physics? Um, you know, and I, yes, I know I, yes. I'd love to, yeah. So sort of like, actually, and this is, I think is somewhat related to your, to your nonprofit work, the uh, sound and science um, yes. potentially, because mm-hmm. I know you do educational work in, in New York city. So maybe you guys mm-hmm. should talk about those th- two things together. I'd love to hear yeah. about those connections. <clears throat> yes. And <clears throat> I think, so I think that's a very, um, uh, um, that point that you just raised there is kind of at the core of, so it's a question of like, you know, we look at these maps or these uh, between music and say physics or music and science. You know, one question I've, I've gotten is a kind of, so what? Like, w- mm. you know, why, why is that useful? Um, well, of course, I mean, you know, it's maybe useful, you know, fireside chat conversations you have with a friend. Um, mm. That, 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 that's useful, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, it's maybe useful to nerd out on it, right? If you're a mm-hmm. fanatic about music and, and science and those of us who are, it's nice to mirror the, them against each other. Yeah, another place where this is useful, well, for me is, and powerful, is in both inspiring and empowering young people um, who normally wouldn't think that they're good at or they like science or mathematics. Mm-hmm. And vice versa, and people who don't really think of themselves as being musical or having talent in music, um, yeah. it can be a very useful tool or way in for students, um, young people, to actually um, see that there is, like, you know, by looking at music and science, um, uh, you know, sort of in um, sort of working together um, and looking at the ways that, that they are connected. So mm-hmm. there is this um, nonprofit I, I started in New York City. I'm from New York City, and I was, you know, one of those weird kids that was um, into music and into physics and science. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this is for, you know, um, public school, um, mainly public school juniors in New York City. Um, and the program is called Sound Plus Science. Um, so, you know, you can find on soundplusscience.com. All one word. So, you know, it, well, it is basically um, project based. So the students are, you know, they work in teams and they work on projects with a mentor where they explore um, through working in a music production type of studio that we call a lab. So there's, you know, things like um, 
uh, modular synthesis, synthesizers, samplers. Um, they do a little bit of coding. They generate their mm -hmm. own sound waves. Um, and while basically making music, and especially this is more of an electronic music making um, sort of um, platform, they, they're working in groups in terms of making music, but they learn the scientific, mathematical, and physical principles behind that. So it's a two-way thing. Mm. So there are lots of interesting connections. I mean, obviously, as I said, for example, rhythm, the way rhythm, certain rhythmical patterns are organized, right? Um, there's a principle, um, which is that there's some kind of um, optimization um, in terms of the, 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 the temporal spacing between um, musical tempo, right? That, mm. that is all based on some beautiful number theory and Euclidean geometry. So there are all mm. these um, ways that, you know, students, especially young people, can, can realize that actually, you know, music and science are not separate things. They can, you know, they can explore. And, and most importantly for me is gaining competence. You know, a lot of times they, they go through, students go through the school system and, you know, when they come to college, like when they come to my university, I find that they, there are certain things that they didn't really, you know, they didn't really nail down. And I find that you can really congeal competence in um, certain mathematical um, ideas and concepts and um, tools, right? And, and right. physics um, by exploring um, the, its um, analogs in music and music making. So that's kind mm. of what that, that whole thing is about. Oh, so cool. Thank you. And I'll, I will link to the description to uh, Sound Plus Science for people to check that out. The um, other thing I, I definitely wanted to ask you about, one of the really cool parts, a turning point in your journey, it sounded like in the jazz of physics, was when you learned of uh, Dr. Isham, his, his interest in Jung and in particular dreams. And uh, I thought that was what an interesting, it's something I'm interested in as well, is sort of uh, the, uh, the subconscious, the unconscious, the things that pop up. You discuss a dream uh, in the book uh, related to like rotating hands and helicity in, in physics that actually led to an insight that in influenced your work. Can you, uh, can you share any other dreams, you know, that have influenced your, your research? Um, hmm. Well, um, um, well, they're very rare. I mean, they, if they mm. happen like twice in my lifetime, <laughs> that, that was one of the, <laughs> well, so I guess it the doesn't other happen. You know, there are, there are things that I, you know, d dreams, including daydreams <laughs> that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that, um, that do, you know, obviously, um, could set me off in a, in a certain direction, but, you know, sometimes I just forget the dreams. Um, I think mm. I, you know, I'm working on a new project with, uh, my postdocs, uh, a new way into thinking about dark matter. And I definitely remember having some sort of dream that at least inspired me to go in the direction that I that we're now in. But sometimes those dreams are more, they're very hazy. They're not really anything mm -hmm. concrete or some, something visual that I can remember. I just, but what I can, sometimes it does, I wake up inspired to go in a certain direction because I did have a dream oftentimes, which I you know, really forget the details of. But sometimes that's just good enough because it just provides a new direction for me to go in. Sure. And that, you know, so far it's leading to, into, into, it's leading us into a, um, some interesting new ideas. Okay. <clears throat> very, very cool. Yeah. Well, last year I, I went to this, um, in New York, there's, uh, the Jung society. They have like a location yeah. close to Bryant park and they held a play about the, uh, the therapeutic sessions between Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli. Mm -hmm. And oh, really? yeah, it was really, really interesting. It was That's like, something uh, I would have been interested in checking out because I was very inspirational in me when I was a younger scientist. Oh, really? Can you tell me more about that? Um, well, you know, when I was a postdoc in London, my, um, w one of my, you know, mentors, a uh, uh, great mathematical physicist, um, Chris Isham was the one that told me that if I wanted to, um, expand my creativity in physics, I mm. should read Carl Jung's, um, writings, um, mm -hmm. and also engage in dream analysis with him. And, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, so one of the things that he also did tell me was um, this, this um, um, about the um, Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli. And there's a book 
call um, atom and archetype, which is mm -hmm. um, these letters exchanged between Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli. Um, yeah, that was very influential on me because obviously Wolfgang Pauli is one of the giants of theoretical physics, period. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, in fact, the particle that he coined that was part of his Nobel Prize called a neutrino is the thing that I'm currently working on in wow. terms of rethinking dark matter. <laughs> so. Mm. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, I find Jung's work um it's 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 incredible and I uh, I discovered was it last year or 2 years ago the red book which were his um these basically daydreams that he had that he recorded over a number of years where he went into his subconscious and had these elaborate uh narratives with uh with gods and with animal it just it was just this incredible i actually have a, one of my more popular explainer videos is on the red book that it, that goes into oh, really? um explaining uh a lot of the symbolism in, in that work and it's no surprise to me that it's you know influenced uh so many scientists the other thing too is uh some, some things you bring up in the book is like schrodinger his interest in uh color theory and mm -hmm. eastern mysticism which i thought was which was pretty interesting um and also uh, Niels Bohr, his interest in uh, Buddhism and Taoism, uh, which is a little less known, but also has a pretty significant impact, I think, on his work. Um, one thing I want to definitely ask you about is that you're no doubt familiar with uh, with Jim, Jim Gates, uh, your colleague, his adinkras, the, uh, yes. the geometric like objects that encode mathematical relationships between supersymmetric particles. Has that impacted your work at all? You think, Chris? Um, indirectly, I mean, Jim, you know, in the sense that Jim Gates is a, one of my, you know, um, one of my um, mentors that really, you know, um, o over the years really has influenced me both uh, in terms of physics and, um, and my, you know, the way I, I think about physics. And um, he's one of the great, you know, theoretical physicists of our times. Um, Yes, one of the things that I did that his um, that inspired me about that is that that's what you know Jim's creation. Jim created his own physical um, theory um, about you know related to the this thing called supersymmetry, which relates a symmetry that relates the force carriers in nature to the matter in nature. So these two mm -hmm. things were thought to be separate things, and supersymmetry is um, a theory that relates them by a symmetry. That symmetry being supersymmetry, mm. um, <clears throat> and Jim's uh, adinkras is a way of understanding why you know what is the underlying um, anatomy behind supersymmetry, and that underlying structure is adinkras. Um, it, it you know it has resonances to to how we think about graphs in graph theory, um, you know edges and links and nodes, um, and there are the relationships between. Um, the objects of these nodes, if I look at a, a little bit, I think of my finger, these fingers as like some, some kind of graph and you have edges and nodes, which is where <clears throat> these edges meet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these nodes and edges have relationships to each other and that's, those relationships encode something fundamental about supersymmetry. What inspired me about that is, a, is the power of, you know, um, um, of the ambition of trying to, you know, come up with your own theories, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Jim's way into that was, of course, complete mastery of, of the known physics. Mm -hmm. So to go out and do something new requires, um, you know, a, a, a deep understanding also of, it doesn't require it, but it helps to, yeah. to have a deep understanding of the known stuff, the known structures to go beyond it. Sure. Um, so that's, that's one concrete way that the Adinkra program um, has influenced me. Oh, cool. Yeah, and I want to be mindful of your time. I, I have like so many more questions I could potentially ask you, but uh, I don't know if you have time for a couple of extra questions, but I, I do mm -hmm. be mindful of your schedule. Do you have to run yeah, we now? Yeah, we can go or... on for a few more. Yeah, we can go on for minutes? a few okay. more minutes. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Thank you for the, the overtime. That's really appreciated. The, um, I definitely, I want to touch on, it's a book that I'm not familiar with, but uh, I think I heard you talk about it in an interview as having some impact on you, the serpent and the rainbow. 
Is that being oh, yeah, one yeah. of your one of your favorite books? Can you tell us why is that? You know, one of one of your favorite books. Well, I mean, I I you know, um, the I also saw the movie and when I was a teenager, and it um, mm. it was amazing because first of all, I I know, I mean, the the, the writer, I mean, the, the, the not the, the the story is based on a true story um, of a friend of mine whose name is Wade Davis. He's a National Geographic explorer and mm -hmm. a, um, <clears throat> uh, an anthropologist. And you know the, what's interesting about that book is, you know, I'm originally from the Caribbean, from Trinidad and Tobago, uh, moved to New York City as a kid, mm -hmm. and I one way I've kept in sort of touch with that culture is by studying the mythology and the folklore. And as you know, um, there are a lot of like, you know, interesting um, um, stories contained in the West African tradition and, you know, voodoo or, or obia, Santeri, these are all sort of um, outgrowth of, of, of the West African tradition in the Caribbean. Um, mm. And, um, you know, Serpent and the Rainbow was about this anthropologist who was trying to understand um, the zombification process. And I found that the, inter, the, the interface in between Western science, right, and these, um, this, you know, what we call high science in mm. these um, West African tradition uh, was really, I don't know, it, it, again, it's like you have these two things um, and how the, you know, that movie was how that played out, right? How the mm. scientist was trying to say, uh, actually, the zombification is nothing mystical. There's actually, you know, um, a psychoactive drug that they're ingesting that put them in that state of mind. But then, you know, the the experiences that these individuals are having um, is something that science cannot explain. So I found mm -hmm. that, you know, that's that's one place where, in hindsight, I found why I was fascinated with that with that uh, book and and movie. Oh, so cool! Yeah, I have to pick it up or you know watch the watch the movie because it, it does look very cool. One of the things you just mentioned that reminded me of it was um, pretty scary too. So that's the other reason. Okay, that's good. I, I like scary. I, I, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I, I like I, horror I, stuff too. Yeah, 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 horror. Yeah, you mentioned mythology, folklore. Are you familiar at all with uh, Joseph Campbell? Yes, I'm familiar. Um, not not too familiar, but I yes. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, for folks, uh, for the audience, perhaps people don't know, he was a professor at St. Lawrence College for almost forty years, and he um, was comparative mythology, comparative religious studies. Uh, his work influenced uh, Star Wars, George Lucas's work. Uh, he's the creator of the Hero's Journey. This idea that uh, yes, well, I'm very simplifying right. it for people, but someone starts off at home, they go out, have adventures, and they eventually come back. And having brought back what they learned back home. And one of the things that reminds me of is, well, the very, very little I know about music theory is that most of the time for most music, you start off, you have, a, you have sort of a home chord. You have uh, mm -hmm. something that starts off the song and you go along with your, you know, throughout the song. And what generally sounds pleasing to the ear is returning back to that home chord. Right. Is this generally right? Is that yeah, yeah. more or less? Yeah. And yes, it reminds yes. me a lot of that hero's journey of this idea. You start off somewhere, always you know, at home. Uh, the adventurer goes out, has adventures, nearly escapes death, right? Um, brings back the nectar of the gods that they found, and they come back home. And that, that returning back home always sounds pleasing to the ear. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or if you've come across anything and say... Uh, mythology or sort of general folklore that kind of uh, maps to music in that way? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, um, in terms of cosmology, the field of cosmology, which studies, as you know, the large scale structure, the evolution, mm -hmm. the origin, and, and the mysteries about our universe as a whole, and our place in it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the field of cosmology. And we use physics right to try to understand that um physics and mathematics and and i think that um you know where is when we think about i think who wrote the book there was a book called at home in the universe and i, I don't remember who wrote the book but um you know we can look for that but the idea yeah, is like it. okay you know if we think about right now there are things we don't know about the universe we don't know its origins we t we, we tend to use the word the big bang but the big bang is really 
a place filler for something we don't understand. Right. But in the context of like, if we believe the universe actually, ex, you know, was really a succession is a succession of expansions and contraction. Um, and the Big Bang be in that place where, you know, the, as the universe may have contracted, um, went into this very dense and highly energetic state called the Big Bang and then expanded again and went through cycles of expansion and contraction. Hmm. And in a sense, you know, the universe returns to home. Um, that home is actually the Big Bang, right? Hmm. Um, or, or the bounce. So that's interesting. I, I would say an analogy, but I definitely think that this idea of Joseph Campbell, and that's a great connection you just made there. Um, so I'm going to go and um, I, I do remember Joseph. I, I was like, that name rings a bell because he, I think I, I was a faculty at Dartmouth College and I think he, he attended Dartmouth College. Um, mm. And so, uh, as well, you know, so I think that that's um, the place where I, 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 I came into contact with, with his name. Oh, so cool. Yeah, yeah, what a connection. The, uh, and that brings me to actually something I definitely wanted to ask you about around the idea of white holes. And, mm. uh, and it kind of related to, yes, the cyclic universe, a lot of uh, Lee Smolin's uh, kind of work. I know, I know you know uh, Smolin. The yes. um, idea, and I think broadly, I don't know if it necessarily means like a universal Darwinism or this Darwinian selection of universes, but can you speak at all to... Um, Maybe, I mean, from your research, from things you've read, uh, your intuition, well, where do we stand in terms of our modern, modern physics understanding around the possibility of like a universal Darwinist kind of take of things? I, you know, um, I find it to be a very attractive um, hypothesis, meaning that we you know, Darwin's natural selection, um, really just being a universal um, way into an understanding the happenings of, of, of life and how, how um, all the chain um, that links all living things is through this process of natural selection. Um, and then, you know, the extent to which that can actually um, be applied or be, um, be reimagined uh, to not just living things, but the entire universe is i think at the core of lee smolin's beautiful idea um and i think that you know it seems like there are some predictions um from that and so the idea is that to to look at how far that that takes us and what kind of predictions it has um i mean so another question is that one can ask is okay it, since uh, natural selection works so well what's beyond it, you know, what's behind mm. that, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, so are, are the physical laws themselves subject to natural selection? And that's something that, you know, um, Lee Smolin, um, Jaron Lanier, the virtual reality pioneer, myself and some other colleagues, we definitely um, played around with, with, with um, those um, ideas. Um, mm. And we call that the autodidactic universe, the idea that even the physical laws themselves um, can change, can evolve, can be subject mm. to some type of something like natural selection. That's so cool. I love that idea and that intuition. Um, autodidactic universe. I've heard a little bit about that. I have to study, study it more. One question, and perhaps one of the last questions I'll ask you here. And I asked the same thing to Brian Keating, your friend, uh, mm -hmm. but I couldn't pin him down on an answer. He kind of like was able to dance around it. And I said, oh, darn, mm. I wish I had uh, pin him down a little bit more. If we could imagine, I like to think of the idea of like a cosmic casino because things have a lot of like probabilities and uh, where people place their bets. Are you familiar at all with roulette, the game of roulette? Yes. Where you, oh, yeah. you place, yes. Yeah, so there's mm -hmm. this, um, you kind of place your bets. So this is around the question of theories of everything. So um, I'm sure you're well versed in there's a lot of theories of everything. I mean, no one knows all of them, but uh, you probably know a lot of the major ones. Say I gave you $100 and you had to kind of, you could place that $100 around to different amounts of bets. You know, you, all, of, all the theories of everything are laid out on a roulette table. You know, uh, so you could say, I want to put, you know, 50 bucks on string theory. I want to put you know, $10 over here, $5 over there. How would you spread that around, you know, based on your, your, your current understanding of things and your, um, your current intuition for all the theories of everything? 
Um, you mean which one is the right one? Or? Yeah, like how would you, well, you can't, well, no one knows for sure, right? So it's sort of like, yeah. how would you place your bets? So if you were a betting man, I force you, I say, I'll give you 300 bucks. You can place around, you're trying to maximize your winnings, right? Um, so, you know, maybe some folks would just feel so confident, 100%, I'm going to put it down on M theory, um, put it on strings, you know, I feel very confident about that. But uh, myself, I'd probably place it around a little bit and, and hedge my bets as to what I think mm. is, is really going on. And yeah. of course, this is just a fun exercise. It's not like to hold you anything. Yeah, I think that the idea behind string theory um, is going to be a big part of the fine. This is just my, you know, as a mm -hmm. person that has worked on sure. string theory a little bit. Um, but I would say that also ideas from, from loop quantum gravity. I think I'll, I would hedge my bet on something where they, both of those theories come together in some, in some mm. um, concrete way that doesn't yet exist. Um, you know, so I think that in loop quantum gravity really uses this very, this powerful idea of background independence that the laws of physics according to Einstein should not depend on the formulation of the spatio-temporal background, the arena of space-time. Um, and in string theory, you know, this, the unifying ideas behind string theory that, you know, the f matter and, and the fields, are, they, they're all different vibrational patterns. I mean, I'm being very loose in my language here, of strings. Sure. And I think that I would, I would place my bets on some unification between string theory and quantum gravity. Awesome. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's useful to hear that and kind of get a sense of where people put their uh, probabilistically think things are, are are leading towards. And one thing I wanted to just a random connection, if I could, from because we didn't get so much into I have a lot of questions to ask you about black holes and the fear of a black universe, which um, we didn't get a ton of time to talk about today. But there was a a we can also talk about in the future. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, I'd love. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, we could. Uh, yeah, pl put a placeholder on this and and return to it. You had a figure that was a representation of torsion. Here's my version in Polish, by the way. I just received oh my this, gosh. This. Oh wow. <laughs> Translated into Polish. Very very cool. Yes. Um, the representation of torsion in LPQ and loop quantum gravity looks so much like a Mobius strip. Um, this is mm. the figure. Yes. I I'm not sure if you're familiar with. Um, Douglas Hofstadter's Girl Escher Bach, um, the landmark work. Our books yeah. have the same publisher in house, which is basic books. So <sighs> my oh. book is seen as some kind of like, you know, part of, of that tradition of, um, of books. Yeah. Well, I see it. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of that. In fact, you know, when I, when I had the option, I had, luckily I had some options of different publishing houses, you know, and when, when, and when I was considering basic and I realized that Douglas Hofstadter's book was in, in basic, I said, I have to, I have to be part of that. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, the, the, the representation reminds me so much of um, the Mobius strip, the crab cannon, the Mobius yeah. strip that he has yes. um, in his book. And it's like, I mean, it's the exact same thing almost. <laughs> so there yes. seems to be connections. It, that, is. Uh, it is, it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I have to explore a little bit and, and then talk about. And this, this is a, from Carnegie Hall. I went the other night. Oh, or concerts wonderful. i go to a lot of music in the city which is which is great um yes, yes great yeah and let's see the uh your thesis i want to ask you about thesis was topological defects in alternative theories to cosmic inflation and string cosmology from a long ways uh back what role does topology play here because i i keep coming up on and you mentioned a little bit earlier uh we were talking about say Pythagoras and uh, geometry as being, you know, integral to this whole story, this narrative. Uh, specifically, what role does topology play, and how does does it continue to uh, to factor into your work today? Big time, big time. I mean, it's such a beautiful um, connection that actually has real um, experiment. I mean, real impact. Mm. Um, in physics and um, so and in surprising ways so like um, you know in qu quantum field theory which we you know which I call the mother language of modern physics mm. um, the quantum theory of fields right and um, um, there are topological um, quantum effects okay um, that 
if when you can when you consider them in a quantum field theory um so one you probably in, in quantum mechanics there are things called there's processes that ha have no classical analog called mm. quantum tunneling which is that mm. you know a quantum object like say an electron can tunnel through or go through a barrier that is that is for, uh, forbidden um by classical means like my hand going through a wall right that's forbidden right. classically but there's a finite probability that my, you know, a quantum particle could tunnel through or go through the wall. And there are effects that are topological in nature that encodes quantum tunneling um, for subatomic particles. And that's, I mean, that's an example of where topology is a real thing in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, the analysis of topology and quantum field theory leading to actually predictions. For example, how, a, how, um, how a, a particle, uh, there's a particle called the eta particle. It's a, you know, it's a subatomic particle made up of quarks, and that particle can actually decay directly into two photons. That's a quantum mechanical process to decay the transmutation of one particle into another set of particles. In this case, the eta particle decaying into two photons. Um, there's a topological effect, a tunneling um, effect, that if it's not taken into consideration as part of that decay process, that tunneling process, would give the wrong answer. Um, and so when you take that into account, you get, you get the right, um, you get the, you know, there's a, a rate or a time it takes for that process to happen. And it gets, you know, that time is um, predicted to be the correct time if you take this quantum effect, this topological effect into account. So topology has real uh, physical yeah. impact in, in, in um, fundamental physics. Oh, and another one has to do with something called a gravitational anomaly. These things are called anomalies. Mm. And the word anomaly has, it has usually have to do with a topological effect, you know, how, how um, the, how, in this case, how a field can basically um, exist in a particular spatial configuration um, that depends on the, the um, topological aspects of that space time. Um, in this case, um, this is a gravitational effect called a gravitational anomaly. That's something that, that I've been um, over the years working on, on in terms of explaining the origin of matter over antimatter in the universe. Mm. But that's, again, a much longer conversation happy yeah. to have in the near future. Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. And uh, the holographic principle as well. That's one of the, uh, this concept that I think very few people in the world know have even heard of the holographic principle but to me it's one of the most incredible things that we know about the nature of reality itself um and it seems like it's i don't know some mapping or some relationship to topology perhaps um what insights you know when did you first learn about the holographic principle and uh what do you think about its importance or significance in our current understanding of of the world I think I first heard about the holographic principle, but it wasn't in the modern, the way that we understand it now. Hmm. Um, you know, I, from reading some of the works of David Bohm, the great um, theoretical physicist. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but then, of course, um, you know, um, from Lenny Susskind himself, you know, um, he gave some le amazing lectures when I was a graduate student. Um, and he, you know, is one of the co-inventors of, of the holographic principle in, in modern physics. Um, so it was, it was great to, to learn it directly from him. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. That was way back in 1999. Mm, got it. Yeah. It's and a very also, compelling idea. Um, you know, yeah. the, you know, the, um, you know, it's inspired by this observation, observing theoretical observation that the entropy of a black hole scales with the area of the black hole rather than the volume. Yeah. Yeah. And so the idea that of um, that that means that information um, can be stored in one dimension less than what you think the information is stored, mm -hmm. right? And also mm -hmm. holograms. You know, if you look at a a, mm -hmm. a, a credit card, you know, and you see a three dimensional image protruding out of a two dimensional screen, somehow that three dimensional information is encoded in that two dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. It uh, boggles the mind as to why or how that could possibly be the case, and it... how 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 yeah how reality can actually uh, um, 
can um yeah can do such a thing yeah absolutely and um one thing i wanted to touch on a little bit the delayed choice experiment i believe you talk about more about that in your book uh fear of a black universe the the seemingly is the sense that uh and i know there's different interpretations of it but a possibility of say retro causality uh being there mm -hmm. um and maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong or if that's been say disproven by now but how do you interpret the implications of the delayed choice experiment we'll say that last part again oh yeah sure just how do you interpret the 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 implications of the the, the of, of the delayed choice experiment uh and specifically for our understanding of, of time and, and causality. Um, you know, I mean, it seems to be saying that somehow, a, you know, a quantum system in the case, in this case, you know, um, electron, you know, going through two slits, you know, two holes. And, and um, that's kind of a, one of the premises of it. Um, that it can retro causally um, decide to change its trajectory almost as if like it can go back, it can go back in time and make that choice. I mean, that's, you know, again, that's what it, that's one of the implications that it suggests, but I, I'm honest, I'm honestly to be, I'm honestly confused about it. I don't understand a delayed choice experiment. So I, you know, it's one of those things it's hard for the human mind, for my human mind to wrap its, itself around um, the implications of it. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me neither. I wish I did. Um, and what, I think I thought one of Paris' last I things I'll ask. I mean, I think yeah. other people understand it much better than me. So uh, it's yeah. not really my, my, you know, it's something I, I remember thinking that I did understand to the point sure. where I wrote about it. But that was so many years ago. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I hear you. Could you discuss your, uh, your ongoing research? So what are you working on right now? Um, and what do you think is particularly exciting or, or promising in, in the in the field generally? Um, well, I, you know, one of the things that I, um, you know, played a, a role in, in in sort of the original was the idea that maybe the gravitational force itself, or if we go beyond gravity, if we try to go beyond Einstein's theory description of of, of gravity, and we take topology, so See, graph general relativity, Einstein's theory is invisible. It's sort of inert to, you know, what, you know, if I have some non-trivial statements about the topology of space-time. And one idea that I've been pushing over the years, me and my colleagues, is the idea that general Einstein's theory can be, um, can be upgraded to take that topological effects into account. And that would actually have real implications for... Um, for the physical world. So if you do such a thing, and we call this dynamical churn Simon's gravity, um, this is what the extension is, an extended version of Einstein's theory. And the right limit, you know, it, um, any extension of any theory has to reproduce all the good results of the, of the, mm -hmm. um, the theory that's, that's, it's, um, that it's extended from. Um, and it, this theory does that. It gives you back Einstein's theory in the right limit. But it also gives you new effects. And one effect is that things called gravitational waves, if we look at the ripples of space-time and the waves, these are gravitational, and we can, we can detect these gravitational waves um, now uh, by looking at super binaries of supermassive black holes and neutron stars. They, they whip up gravitational waves that we can observe on Earth um, with the LIGO experiment, um, observatory. Um, that, it would, that this theory actually predicts that the gravitational waves of the left-handed sort and the right-handed sort, these are waves that are spinning in a given handedness, um, that you would have an asymmetry between left and right. And we call that parity violation. Um, parity is a notion that um, a physical system um, um, in the, the mirror reflection of a, of a physical system will look the same as a physical system itself. Parity violation says that if I consider the mirror reflection of a physical system, it's not the same. Um, mm -hmm. And so this, the gra in this case, gravity is upgraded to actually have that feature. And mm -hmm. it, that, that theory is being, you know, um, that's something I've been working on, how to, how, to, um, how to detect and how to predict um, 
make predictions for future experiments. Um, and, and also theoretically, it turns out that that theory has, it has interest in links to both string theory and loop quantum gravity um, mm -hmm. um, in terms of, so that's one thing. Another thing I'm working on is um, a new way of thinking about dark matter. I can't give the answer away because yeah, uh, we're in the middle of it now, but sure. you can ask the question, does dark matter, is dark matter really something new or is it just a new, a different way of looking at known physics and known matter, right? So in other mm. ways, could, could the, what we call the visible matter really be dark matter? Could dark matter actually be some configuration or state of the visible matter that we didn't consider before? Mm. Um, and I think so far the answer is yes some forms of dark matter, but maybe not all of the dark matter um, can actually be such a thing. But wow. we'll have to wait for another maybe month um, till that paper comes out. Very cool. Oh, I cannot wait to see it. I'll be on the lookout for, uh, for the paper and uh, we'll share it in the description of, of, of this podcast episode. Uh, one last question I'd love to leave you with. Between you and Brian Keating, who has the better basketball game? <laughs> well, you know, there have been times where, yeah, you know, back when, when we were grad students at, at Brown, um, we used to do, do a lot of pickup playing. Um, and from time to time, one, one on one, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, you know, I think the last game we played, he did beat me. But, you know, you know. I would say that it it depends on if I had a good day or a bad bad day, but mm. I think I think he owes me a game now, and I think this time around I will slam dunk on him. Oh my gosh! I, slam I, dunk. I just gotta fix I, I just gotta fix my knees. That's all. I just gotta fix my knees. <laughs> Get those ups back! Wow, I don't even see. Mm -hmm. I mean, I play pickup in New York almost every day, and I rarely see yeah. any 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 dunkers, any in game dunkers. So mm. yeah, I'll be yeah. uh, I'll have to yeah. I'll have to be there for that. Right. <laughs> Brian's a bit of a juggernaut, so he has a way of um, hacking his way to to the rim, you know? Um. Gotcha. He's a hacker. <laughs> got it. He, uh, yes. <laughs> the ground game he's got. Well, right, right, I, right. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, um, Professor. That was a lovely conversation. Thank you for going over as well. We, we got to talk about many, but not everything, of course, in the jazz of physics and left a lot of a lot of questions about black holes, dark matter, dark energy. Perhaps we could talk about that another time because I'd love to cover more uh, from this book. And uh, I'll link below in the description for people to pick up both books. Uh, I highly recommend both. Uh, they're wonderful. And uh, and yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Yes, it's my pleasure. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'll be back. I'll be, uh, it's my 15 year reuni reunion in a couple of months. I don't know if you go to campus dance, but if you do, I hope to see you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, reach out. I'll be, I'll be on campus. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'd love to yeah. say hello in person and, and catch you, catch you around. So thanks again. It was a wonderful conversation. All right. Thank you, Carlos. Thank Talk you. Talk to you soon.